we have Elizabeth Chadwick, who decided on uh, a career writing historical fiction while still at school, uh, and spent the next 17 years chasing that goal while working in a supermarket to make ends meet. She's now highly successful and the award-winning author of 23 novels, uh, including the New York Times bestseller, The Greatest Night, and The Scarlet Lion, about her hero, William Marshall. A member of the Royal Historical Society, she is renowned for the depth of her research and has just completed the, her trilogy on Eleanor of Aquitaine with The Autumn Throne, which was published on Thursday. Um, her hero that she's going to be championing today is William Marshall, or William the Marshall, which one do you prefer? William Marshall. Um, a fantastic knight from the 12th and 13th centuries. Okay, um, then we've got Joanna, uh, Joanna Hickson, born in Hertfordshire. As a teenager, Joanna Hickson returned to England from a childhood spent in Australia, lost her Aussie accent, visited <laughs> her first castle, and fell in love with medieval history. <laughs> During a career in broadcasting, she wrote a children's novel based on that formative visit called Rebellion at Orford Castle, and an unmentionable number of years later has been writing adult historical novels, which is not, I think, <laughs> quite what we get. <laughs> 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 not quite that. Um, adult historical novels. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> 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 mine. Uh, turning nice. a literary laser. <laughs> onto the 15th century and focusing on the family that came from nowhere to take the English throne, your favourite, the Tudors. <laughs> um, particularly before they were famous. Uh, if you're lucky, you'll have an advanced proof copy of her latest novel, The First of the Tudors, uh, in your goodie bag. Um, it features the hero that she'll be talking about today, who is Jasper Tudor, and the book is out in December, appropriately on the first of the month, being the first of the Tudors. Uh, okay, now, then we've got Susanna Dunn, who is the author of two short story collections and 11 novels, six of them historical, set in the Tudor period, again, it's a very popular period, including The Confessions of Catherine Howard, which was a Richard and Judy Pick. Her most recent novel, published last year, is The Lady of Misrule, and today she's going to be half-heartedly <laughs> championing <laughs> Anne Boleyn. <laughs> Um, okay, Someone and then and finally, <laughs> sorry, and finally we have um, Elizabeth Fremantle, who works as a journalist, contributing to device publications including the Sunday Times, Vogue, and Vanity Fair, and nowadays reviews fiction for the Express. She is the author of a Tudor trilogy. There's a theme beginning. <laughs> um, Queen's Gambit, Sisters of Treason, and Watch the Lady, which looks at the late Tudor court culture and power structures through the prism of women's lives. <coughs> Her latest novel, Girl in the Glass Tower, about Arbella Stewart, raised to be Elizabeth heir, only to have her claim thwarted by her cousin James, is now out. Uh, and so you're doing Arbella Stewart. Okay, and I am Angus Donald. I'm not doing Tudors, you'll be glad to hear. Um, I am... I can't remember if that oh, myself. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> um, I spent a large proportion of my early life um, travelling and working in Asia. And I came back when I was coming up for 40 and started being English again. Um, I'm a former Times and FT journalist. Um, I'm now uh, living in Kent and I'm the author of the, of the best selling Outlaw Chronicles. Uh, eight books uh, with a gangster like Robin Hood, so it's a sort of twist on the normal. Um, Robin Hood thing. He's not a very nice guy. Um, in fact, he's pretty awful, but there are nice people in the books. Um, he, it's, a, it's, it's in a, a, a well-researched historical background, so it's not just random stories there, actually taking place in the historical background of 12th and 13th century Europe. My last novel in the series is called The Death of Robin Hood, a bit of a spoiler in the title, <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, came out about two weeks ago. Um, and I'm going to be my hero is not Robin Hood, <laughs> um, but I'm going to reveal who it is as part of the Robin Hood talk, so there's a little bit of mystery there, but uh, that's, uh, that's, that's coming soon. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to get each of our, our panellists to talk about their hero and explain why they are so wonderful, uh, and I'm going to start with Elizabeth Chadwick here. Okay, everyone hear me? Yeah. I'm going to talk about William Marshall. Um, he began his career as a diplomat at the tender age of five years old when he was a hostage during a vicious civil war. 
His delightful charm convicted, convinced, not convicted, <laughs> convinced King Stephen, his father's enemy, not to hang him, and they ended up playing games in the king's tent. William survived his ordeal and went on to become a great jousting champion in the tournaments on his white stallion, Blancard. As a young knight, he saved the life of Eleanor of Aquitaine during an ambush, but was wounded and captured himself. In gratitude for his courage and sacrifice, Eleanor paid his ransom and took him into a household where he became the tutor in chivalry to her eldest son, Henry, the young king. He stuck by the young man through thick and thin, and when he died while rebelling against his father, William promised to take the young king's cloak to Jerusalem and fulfil the pilgrimage vow that his lord had been unable to complete. William made that arduous journey and spent three years in the Holy Land fulfilling that vow and returned to, save, to serve and save Henry II with that utter steadfast loyalty and intelligence that he'd shown throughout his life. When the dying Henry was being hunted down by his son Richard the Lionheart in a hard chase, William turned his own horse and not only stood in Richard's path but brought Richard's horse down, even knowing it might mean the end for himself. As it happened, Richard rewarded that loyalty by making William an earl and giving him the great heiress Isabel de Clare in marriage. The first thing William did was take Isabel away on honeymoon to get to know her. They'd never met before. But he took her away to a quiet country retreat and they had, you know, about six weeks together on their own. They went on to have ten children, five boys and five girls. William was a man of balance in everything he did. <laughs> As a co justiciar William assisted Eleanor of Aquitaine to rule the Angevin Empire while Richard was on the Third Crusade. He found himself having to walk a tightrope between the various factions and did so with astuteness and aplomb, always staying loyal to the crown but never shutting the door on negotiating with the opposition. After Richard died, he continued in this mode of operation. He had a really difficult time with King John, who on more than one occasion accused him of treachery when their interests clashed. But William was savvy enough not to lose his cool and he was the man John called for when he found himself in dire straits with the church and the barons. William came to his aid and was at his side throughout the Magna Carta crisis and again a voice of reason. When John died, William was asked to take on the regency. Basically, there was no one else. The barons wouldn't trust anyone else to take the job and all those many years of open-minded networking came to fruition. Not that William wanted the job entirely. He cried when he was elected and because of his age, um, he was 70, and because he felt that everything was hopeless. But nevertheless, having had some tears in private, he wiped his eyes, took a stiff drink, and he got on with it. He got people talking, he issued pardons, he paid the troops from what he could scrape together, so somehow held the army and the economy together, and he persuaded the invading French to leave English shores, first by the successful Battle of Lincoln, where he led from the front, and then the Battle of Sandwich, a sea battle where he watched from the shore and directed operations. And then, by negotiation. William could and would fight if he had to, but was well versed in non combative diplomacy. The French dealt with, William and his advisers issued a revised version of Magna Carta. Professor David Crouch says, It was William Marshall and his council who provided the final form of the text and consigned it to the ages. William Marshall set the English monarchy and its peoples on a new and very distinctive course. It was the one taken into English statute law. He died on a May morning in April 1219 with his family in great grief round his bed. He had taken the vows of a Templar knight on his deathbed and was subsequently buried in the Temple Church in London, where you can still go and visit his effigy. Even 20 years after his death, his tenants at Caversham were still remembering him as not just a good man, but the finest of them all. Mainly the Marshal, as all-round statement and hero beyond the tourney field, um, was the Nelson Mandela of his day, I believe. He pulled it all together and not only saved the country, but also reworked the Magna Carta as a document capable of posterity. And that's why he's my hero. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, Joanna. Um, can we have your hero or heroine, please? Well, to be honest, um, my hero 
And I've, I've sort of left my, um, I'm letting the side down a bit here because I, I normally have written up to now about heroines. Um, but this time I was allowed by my publishers, trusted to take on a male center, central character and his name was the reason I took him on because his name is Jasper. And it just, I love, I love the name Jasper. It's, it's a, a great name and uh, I wondered why on earth he was called Jasper because his mother was... Catherine de Valois, who, if you buy my book, The Agincourt Bride, and the sequel, The Tudor Bride, you will discover all about her. She was the one I fell in love with, and it's her child. He was the second child that she had with her squire, Owen. I won't say the magic word now, because his name wasn't Tudor then, so I'll, I'll come to that. Um, Jasper Tudor was the second son that they had in their, uh, from their mesalliance, and um, I thought, first of all, I'm going to do some research on why he was called Jasper. So I looked first at gemstones, because Jasper is a gemstone. And I dug into the values of Jasper in medieval times as a jewel, as a jewellery uh, gemstone. And uh, it was used a lot, especially by the royalty, because it was supposed to endow the wearer with fairness and justice. And I think most kings really, if, even if they weren't, wanted to be considered fair and just. Um, that, was, that was the one that, that drew me to him. Then I also discovered that it is used in healing and survival. Um, I don't quite know how, but I, I managed to invent how it was used. Um, and it led midwives to use it to help along with a tricky childhood, a childbirth. So um, take a, a, a red-headed child being born in a tricky way, and the use of Jasper in the birth and uh, the fact that her, his mother was a queen and had a jasper ring, and it all worked sort of together in the book, and that's how it happened. So, birth of a hero, um, and then obviously I had to start writing the character of him and his brother, Edmund, who was born only a year before him. Um, then, so I, the, their characters came to me through the sources, the historical sources. There was very, very, very little on them, obviously, because they were born in class clandestine way. Um, however, um, when I got hold of them and, uh, and drew them in a way, um, Jasper, uh, or rather Edmund, the older one, uh, was the dominant older brother. He was tall, dark, handsome, very uh, clever, proud, and quick-tempered. Uh, he, he was, you know, there were two sides to, to Edmund. But Jasper turned out to be the easygoing younger brother, uh, ginger-haired, Friendly, courageous, naturally skilled with weapons, determined, loyal. Ring any bells? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Um, I, I, you know, <laughs> he, I think he, he. I wondered how he would turn out as a man, um, and. Uh, that was kind of how it was. So um, Jasper of Hatfield, as he was called when he was born, or by the scribes when he was born, um, he became popularly known as Lord Jasper later when his uh, half-brother, King Henry VI, gave him a, an, an earldom, Earl of Pembroke. And uh, the name Tudor therefore came to notice for the first time um, when these two boys were made earls. They were named as Edmund and Jasper Tudor. Um, the, the name Tudor is, is random, really, because their father was Owen, and they, uh, they, they decided that they would pick the last name at the end as the surname for this man. So he became Owen Tudor, and his children became Jasper and Edmund and Jasper Tudor. Um, they were plucked from obscurity by Henry in order to boost the numbers of his supporters at court, because... You know, he hadn't got his own children by then. Uh, in 1453, his son actually was born in 1453, but much later. Um, so this Tudor surname suddenly came into the forefront. So I had my hero with a top-selling name. Uh, but how to persuade my publishers that I should actually write a hero and not a heroine? Well, proof of the writing is in the reading, so um, you can see it when you, if you've got a copy already, and if you, when you buy it. Sorry, not if. <laughs> but I'll just give you the pitch that I gave, um, brief pitch that I gave to my editor, and 
presumably they passed it on. Jasper Tudor was the great survivor of the Wars of the Roses in which York and Lancaster tore England apart, as we know. And his life was one of bloody battles, narrow escapes, blighted love, and heartwarming romance, always guided by an unswerving loyalty to his frail and peace-loving half-brother, King Henry VI. First of the Tudors, the title of my book, follows Jasper from youthful obscurity to power and glory, from disappointment in love to forbidden passion, from happy family man to lonely exile, diplomatic success to military defeat, and finally, through treachery and reconciliation, to a hard-won triumph as his brother is restored to the throne. Well, we all know that's only half the story, because um, we know what happened next. But the story ends there, and um, it's not bad going, I don't think, for a ginger-haired, chip-toothed younger son with a disarming smile. <laughs> That one. <laughs> so that's my hero. Is he better than theirs? Well, let's see. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joanna. Um, can we have uh, Susanna, please, next? We might. Uh, is this all right, sound wise? Yeah? Okay. Right, okay, some difficulties here. About uh, two years ago, Carol said, come along to the HNS, how lovely to be asked. I said, yeah, great. And then things would come through over the two years, and I'd go, yeah, great, whatever. And then it got to last weekend, and I looked at this, and I thought, I haven't got a heroine, I haven't got a hero. My novelist's brain doesn't really work like that, which was interesting for me, but not very interesting for you. Uh, so I was reflecting upon that, and I thought, okay, um, I'll, do, um, I'll do The Duchess of Suffolk, uh, Catherine Willoughby, and the only reason for that was because she was a Protestant and she named her lapdog Gardner after a Catholic bishop, Stephen Gardner, so that she could make her friends laugh by calling him to heal. That, to me, that's a heroine. And then I thought, but he wants five minutes and I don't speak very slowly, so I can't do her because that's the only thing I've got to say about her. We've done about 30 seconds, haven't we? I loved her in other ways, but I couldn't put my finger on those. It was just the dog uh, calling the dog to heal. So um, over about 48 hours, I thought, well, who am I going to do? You know, who is my hero? I mean, I'm sure I have heroes and heroines in real life, in, in contemporary, but, but not, I didn't think I did, I don't think I do in history and as, as approaching it as a writer. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to weigh in with Anne Boleyn, who's a bit of an anti heroine. And I'll, I wrote my first historical novel uh, about Anne Boleyn, um, and so I haven't revisited her for some while, but hey, she looms large enough that I think I can remember enough about her. Uh, I'm hoping I can anyway. And I think what attracted to me, well, I came to, to Anne Boleyn as a non. Uh, I, I don't think I'd ever read any historical fiction, and I certainly hadn't written any. So it was foreign land to me, but and I, it's a, a long story about how I came across... Oh, obviously, I knew a little bit about Anne Boleyn. You know, you do them at primary school, don't you? You visit Hampton Court. I knew a little bit. But coming to Anne Boleyn, why I took her on, actually, was because I thought, what are you doing in the 16th century? She seemed to me an entirely modern woman, and it was that for me. That was the starting point uh, for me. And also, I feel that um, fictional portrayals of her, film, telly, books, get her fundamentally wrong. For me, my feeling was that she's always portrayed as cold and calculating, cold and cool and calculating, and actually what she was, rather to her downfall, actually is passionate. That, that's what she is for me. And I think I wouldn't want to have been, I wouldn't want it to have been downwind of that passion, quite frankly, as many people were, but from the safety of 500 years on, I think I'm going to put her up as my heroine, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll go with her in a funny kind of way. Um, okay, when I said she was passionate, not about Henry, actually. Um, I think people make that mistake, and I think he made that mistake, actually, uh, and um, that, so that didn't go well in the end. Um, I think it, it's ambition with Anne, isn't it? It was ambition, a roaring great ambition uh, coming from Anne, and it wasn't to be Henry's wife. That was sort of incidental. It was to be... It was to be queen. It was to be his queen, yes. Um, uh, I think she saw, I don't think, I know, I know, that she saw the two of them as a team. 
And I think, I think he didn't see that. Um, and that's why it all unraveled when she finally got what she wanted. I think she saw them as potentially marvellous together and the two of them were going to bring in the New England, OK? And I think that wasn't on his agenda at all. Um, but that's what she was thinking So as a team. And that ambition for the new world, the modern world, the New England, you can hear it 500 years on humming through her veins. So roaring great ambition. Um, she was she wasn't um, womanly and she wasn't queenly. Of course, that was her downfall, of course, when, you know, she was all very exciting for the seven years of build-up, but when he got her as the wife, she wasn't, she wasn't seemly. She was a ladette, really, wasn't she? She much preferred male company. If I met her now, absolutely not my kind of person. The, the ambition, um, I don't think she liked women very much. Uh, she was much happier in the company of men. Um, and that does not mean she was sleeping with them. You know that she didn't. That was made up. Uh, but the company of her brother and his friends, uh, she was a, a very much a woman in a man's world, and she was happy, happy operating in a man's world. And that was, of course, very different for that, uh, for that period of time. And she also couldn't rely on her womanly attributes, because she didn't have any. She was small. You know, the Tudors, you know what they wanted. Big bosoms, buxom, big bosoms, blondy, gingery, blue-eyed. <laughs> even Catherine of Aragon was blondy, gingery, blue-eyed, even though she was a Spaniard. That was the ideal. And, of course, Anne was absolutely the opposite. She was small she was sallow, she was dark, um, she was unusual looking. And I think that's fascinating when somebody uh, can't use the conventional ways to get power. Uh, and she couldn't fall back on that, and I think that makes her very interesting uh, for us as readers and writers down the years. She was uncompromising. Well, understatement, and I have to admire that from 500 uh, years on. She was seven years' worth of uncompromising, wasn't she, really, uh, in the face of national and international um, condemnation, uh, and actually persisting through those seven years when obviously in a way, what she was going for was getting less and less likely. She was getting older. You know this. You, you know she's often, uh, it, you'll know better. But in the, pop, the very popular imagination, it's young woman transplants older wife. Well, of course, you all know Anne Boleyn wasn't young. When all this started, she was 26, which was, you know, getting on a little bit for an aristocratic, for a noble woman, for a noble gal. And, of course, she was 33 when she married Henry. And so what's happening to your childbearing prospects by 33? particularly if you've not got those hips, which she hadn't. So it was already looking very difficult. And she never seemed to waver. I know that's foolish. It's, in a way, I'm putting her up as heroine. And actually, she was very naive, in a way, and hapless and reckless, because it was less and less likely it was going to work uh, as she went on. Um, and uh, the other thing I love about her, are you panicking time-wise? Yeah, no respecter for authority. Um, uh, and I have to admire that. No, oh, sorry, no. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, and she didn't take easy targets, um, you know, Wolsey. Uh, she was very public. I'm really winding up now. She was public about her grievances. Again, horrible. I wouldn't want this in my friend. Or Very public about her grievances. And God, could she hold a grudge. You know, she would hold seven years' worth of grudges. She would see it through to the last minute and dance on your uh, grave. And I'm just going to say, but I'm not going to say what they were. If you're a novelist, I think very often you think in terms of scenes, you know, because you're writing in terms of scenes. And Anne Boleyn, she was so public in how she conducted her private life without any... Uh, worry for how it looked that of course marvellously those are fed down to us we have them intact her upbraiding Henry for this that and the other her swearing so badly in front of ambassadors that they they, they walked out of her presence which of course you weren't allowed to do you had to ask the monarchs permission to leave their presence uh, you know a genuinely shocking person wouldn't want any of it in my living room but I have to hold her up you've not given me enough time to do it just <laughs> <laughs> I think you have done it just as brilliantly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Susanna. Um, Elizabeth Fremantle, if you could give us your hero or heroine. Yes, please. okay. So, I, I, like Susanna, I couldn't make up my mind uh, about who I was going to choose to champion on this panel. And I, you know, I wanted to talk about all the extraordinary women I've written about. I mean, I'm always going to champion a woman because that's just the kind of person I am. <laughs> And I mean, I could have talked about Catherine Parr, first, one mm. of the first women to publish a book in the English language. How amazing. A lot of people um, just think of her as that dull one who, who survived marriage to an old demon just because he died. Um, the Grey sisters, their lives blighted by their royal blood, who somehow found ways to achieve their freedom. 
in, in some small way. Um, Levina Tierlink, she was a portrait painter to four Tudor monarchs, and no one's heard of her. Um, her work, there's hardly any of it still exists, but you know, she was somebody out there making a living at a time when women just didn't do that. Great hero. Um, or um, one of my super favourites who was a, you know, nearly, she nearly made it onto the one I was going to champion, Penelope Deverick, sister to the doomed Earl of Essex. She was the inspiration for much of Philip Sidney's poetry and a proud adulteress who refused to be bound by enforced marital misery and lived openly with her lover, bearing his children, and got away with it. Uh, she was highly political and deeply involved in her brother's insurrection, was the only woman on the list of perpetrators and the only one to escape trial. Uh, you have to wonder why, and I address that in my previous novel, Watch the Lady. Um, uh, they're all remarkable women, and their, their stories have all been deemed ov over the years as insignificant beside those of their male counterparts. But I'm not going to talk about any of them. I'm, gonna talk, I'm not going to talk about a Tudor woman. I'm going to talk about a Jacobean woman, um, Arbella Stewart. Partly because she did live an extraordinary life, partly because she was, she was one of those unfortunate women who, who was born with a lot of royal blood like for women in that, that period, really. And we only have poor Jane Grey's example to go with for that. We all know what happened to her. But she was the most challenging heroine I've ever had to write because you, she, was, she was a difficult, prickly, self-destructive, yet fascinating woman. And we know a lot about her because she was a prolific letter writer and because she was an important woman. The many, many of those letters have survived, a whole large book full, which is really unusual from that period. And in fact, as we go into the Jacobean, Jacobean period, we do get a lot more of these, the, you know, the, 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 the texts survive. So we have that voice, that unique and individual and intimate voice. Um, Arbella, she, she might have been England's first Stuart Queen. In fact, she was the presumed heir for much of her young life. And um, I'll sort of unpack that bit and explain a little bit why, for those of you who don't know her. Um, she was the niece of Mary, Queen of Scots, who did have, we know about her claim to the throne, because she lost her head because of it. Um, and she was the first cousin of James VI of Scotland, who obviously later did become King of England. Um, Elizabeth I had no heir of the body, as we know, she was the Virgin Queen, and um, had no, there were no strong male claimants around that period. Mary, Queen of Scots, was next in line to, for most of Elizabeth's reign, and that was hugely problematic, obviously, because she was a Catholic. And that became a constant source of consternation for Elizabeth, who, who felt the very real threat of Catholic plots. There were many, many uh, attempts, assassination attempts on her. Um, some quite creative. Someone tried to poison the pommel of her saddle once. Um, um, anyway, once Mary, Queen of Scots, had been executed um, on Elizabeth's order, that left very few candidates. And though James Stuart had the more direct claim, coming from both his father and his mother, back to Margaret Tudor, who had married James IV of Scotland, his great-grandfather, I think. Um, not very good with numbers. Um, he was born a foreigner. I know that's not the case now, um, because Scotland is part of Great Britain. We hope well, that will stay, stay as, as such. Um, but it was, it was a foreign land then, an old enemy, actually. And it was constitutionally problematic for a foreigner to take the throne of England. So focus alighted on our Bella. Uh, she only had blood for blood royal. She was also a Stuart royal, and which, uh, which meant that her line went back to Margaret Tudor as well, but only through one line. Um, no, so, so she had a, a weaker claim, but she was born in England. So, so that was considered, she was considered the heir. There were a few others, I'm not going to go into them because that, that's just confusing. There were quite a number who thought they might end up on the throne. 
Um, but Elizabeth seemed to intimate, and she didn't. She never declared anyone for the throne. Oh my God, not me too. Um, <laughs> so we've only got five okay. minutes each. Otherwise, it's she, Elizabeth said publicly, one day she will even be as I am. So, so, so which led everybody to believe that she was she was the the heir. But because of her position and the fear that she might be kidnapped and used to push Elizabeth off the throne. She was kept a virtual prisoner in the kind of magnificent gilded cage that is Hardwick Hall. More glass than wall, I'm sure lots of you know it, and it's a wonderful place. I really recommend it. It's a place to visit. Um, and under the sharp eye of her indomitable and ambitious grandmother, Bess of Hardwick. But Arbella wasn't going to be kept down. She made several thwarted attempts to take control of her destiny, plotting to escape from Hardwick. But when eventually Elizabeth died, England had no appetite for another woman on the throne, and despite his status of foreigner, James was installed as, as king. Um, uh, but in Arbella at that time, she really understood that she was a complete misfit, and she said, rather poignantly, I must shape my own coat according to my cloth, but it will not be after the fashion of this world, God willing, but fit for me. So she was someone who was prepared to really go out there and say, and, and strike a path for herself. She was uh, impelled to live at court because her brother, her cousin, the king, wanted to keep an eye on her, and, and also was the unwitting focus of a failed plot to oust him, so was even more closely watched. But effectively, she had moved from one gilded prison to another, and her only escape would be to marry. But James was reluctant to make... Uh, I'm, I'm coming to the end. I just, I just want to kind of give her her best yeah. shot. Okay. Um, and so she took matters into her own hands, and unfortunately the man she, man she chose to marry also had a tenuous claim to the throne, and so the pair were placed under arrest. Her, she and he both made a, an attempt to escape, and I'm not going to tell you what happens, because you've got to buy my book and find out. Um, but her blind determination to achieve her freedom makes her a true heroine for me. Sorry. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> 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 it's all about to be hurrying people along, but we can't, you know, there is a sort of time parameter. This is, um, yeah. um, okay, the, um, you've heard uh, some brilliant um, stuff about other people's uh, heroes and heroines, but I'm going to tell you, this is the real one. <laughs> um, the title of the panel is Real Life Heroes and Heroines, and you've heard them speak so well, but my hero, Robin Hood, I might as well confess straight away, is not real. <laughs> At least, um, I don't believe the character that we all know as Robin Hood, the do-gooding, thigh-slapping, jaunty, hat-wearing, lovable, Lincoln-green-clad outlaw who stole from the rich, gave to the poor, supported King Richard, and ran endless rings around the Sheriff of Nottingham, really existed. There was never such a guy. Um, before you all start shouting cheat and throwing rotten eggs at me, I will say that I will be talking about a real historical person in a few minutes' time who might have, who I think has a very plausible claim to being the real Robin Hood. And I'm going to keep that um, for under my hat for a little bit. Um, I want to talk about what, um, what Robin Hood would have been like if he had been a real person. Uh, and reveal some of the thinking that I did before coming up to, with this character, my Robin Hood in, in the Outlaw Chronicles, who is pretty awful, to be honest. Um, first of all, he would have been nothing like um, the guy in the movies. He, so forget about Errol Flynn. The real Robin Hood would have been awful. He would have been, if you think of it, he would have been a hard man, ruthless, cruel, brutal, someone who basically could control... Uh, you think running a panel is difficult. Think about trying to control a group of medieval criminals and having them all respect you and how you would keep them in line and what sort of things you might have to do. Um, and basically, he would have been a gangster. So my Robin Hood is actually a gangster who will cut your tongue out, who will kill you, torture you, do whatever, if you step out of line. He'll give protection to uh, villages in Sherwood, but for a price in the good old-fashioned Don Corleone style of protection. Um, I, I, you might think that that's just fanciful and making it all up, but if you look at the original, if you look at the original ballads of Robin Hood, um, you find that actually his behavior is much more gangster-like than you might imagine. There's the, one of the earliest ballads is called Robin Hood and the Monk, 
uh, which is circa 1450. And um, in that story, Robin is an outlaw. He's praying in, um, in a church in Nottingham, and a monk sees him there and goes and informs on him to the police, sorry, to the sheriff, um, and basically squeals. Um, and little John and much the miller's son catch up with this monk and kill him for informing against their friend to the authorities. Um, there's a little boy, a page, who witnesses this murder of the monk. So they kill the little boy too. So this is the behaviour, and this is quite acceptable. This is fine. Nobody, nobody bats an eye about murdering children in the early ballads of Robin Hood. So that's just an example of the kind of guy he might have been. Um, if the original guy was a violent thug, um, the Robin Hood that was created by the repetition of the oral stories and later by novelists, playwrights, and movie producers is good and noble if entirely fiction. Is a good and noble if entirely fictional hero. The character grew and changed much over time. He was originally a yeoman, which is a middle-class landowner, not either an earl or a peasant or a um, whatever. He was a yeoman right in the middle. Um, and he was turned into an earl by the Victorians who felt that he needed a little bit more class. They were rather snobbish. Um, he, he starts out in the earliest ballad as someone who venerates the Virgin Mary. He's a big devotee of the Virgin Mary. And then you have the Reformation in this country, and suddenly that's airbrushed out. No, he's no longer a big fan of, of Mary. Um, he starts out as a simple thief, a trickster, who steals for no particular reason except he wants the money from, from the authorities and thumbs his nose at them and basically la runs rings around, makes them look stupid. And that's the original Robin Hood, just a thief. By the time we get to the 20th century, he's become a kind of lefty class warrior who's fighting for the oppressed and has got a message. And if he does steal, he's endlessly giving it back, so it makes it OK that he's stealing. Originally, the stealing was fine. There's no problem with that at all. But he, so, well, the point I'm making is he changes over, over the 800 years since may or may not have existed. Um, and uh, he, sorry, he changes and he's infinitely mutable and this is why he endures, because he can change. We can make him whatever we like, whatever kind of hero that we need, we can have in Robin Hood. Um, sometimes, um, what, it, during this change, people, the storytellers who are telling these oral stories in the pubs used to, would, would take the deeds of real men and sort of graft them in and then turn them into Robin Hood stories. Um, which leads me to the real historical character, who I genuinely think has a plausible claim to be the real Robin Hood, um, or the model for some of the later stories of the outlaw. Um, in the north of England, which I, I was up in Sherwood two weeks ago for a Robin Hood festival, um, uh, the debate, as people were still talking about this, people, the debate still rages between Nottinghamshire and Yorkshire folk about where Robin Hood is from. I personally, I come from Tunbridge in Kent. Uh, <laughs> and I can categorically state today that the real Robin Hood came from, wait for it, Kent. <laughs> that didn't go down well, by the way. <laughs> I've been sure. Um, my candidate for the real Robin Hood is a Kentish squire called William of Cassingham, uh, also known as Willikin of the Wheel. Cassingham is a small town about 10 miles north of um, one park. Um, north of Hastings. So it's right down there in the Weald of Kent. It's sort of suburbia now, but it was thickly forested, kind of Sherwood foresty, very impenetrable Weald of Kent at the time, in the, in the 12th, 13th century. Um, I came across this guy, um, William of Kent Cassium, or William of Kentsham, or Willikin of the Weald, which is a rather horrible name, but that's what he was, his nickname was Willikin of the Weald. Um, and when I was researching The Death of Robin Hood, which is my latest and last book in the Outlaw Chronicles series, and there's some out there if you want to buy one later on. Um, and I, once I found this character, I knew this real life guy, I knew I had to have him in the book, um, working with Robin Hood and, and learning tricks from him, um, just for novelistic purposes. Um, so basically what happened is in, in the summer of 1216, a French army under Prince Louis the Dauphin, who was the son of Philip II of France, um, invaded Britain, invaded England um, with a large army of French knights. And um, they were invited to come in by the rebels who were opposing um, King John after Magna Carta. There was the first Baron's Rebellion. The barons uh, were in, uh, up in arms against King John. And they invited the French to come in, the French Dauphin to come in and be king. 
Uh, a lot of people don't know this bit of history, but they were very, very nearly successful. At one point, they controlled half of England. Um, he was, uh, Louis was acclaimed King of the English in St. Paul's Cathedral. He wasn't crowned king, but a lot of the, he was, crowned, he was acclaimed King of the English in St. Paul's. They couldn't find a bishop to do the coronation in, in uh, Westminster Abbey. Um, but the King of Scotland, Alexander, came down with an army all the way down, unmolested by John, who was hiding in the West, uh, and did homage for Scotland to this French prince. And uh, about half the barons also did homage to him as well. So uh, this was a very real, they were very, very close to repeating the success of 1066. I mean, that's one of those moments when history takes a, a kind of turn this way or that way. We could have gone back to being French, but we didn't. Partly because of Willikin and the Weald, right? <laughs> or my candidate for Robin Hood. Who's um, wind up the, the chair? Who's, sorry? Who's winding up who's the, winding chair? the chair? <laughs> <laughs> I've got two sentences to go. Oh, so. good. <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. The French invasion was fiercely resisted. We're, we're going to do questions in a second. Okay. <laughs> I've read this book and it's fantastic. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, um, literally, I've got you know, two sentences to go. So, um, okay. Um, right. The French invasion was, invested, uh, was resisted by Willikin of the Weald. He raised a guerrilla army in the Weald of about a thousand bowmen. He himself was a really skilled bowman. Uh, and they waged guerrilla warfare, jumping out and ambushing the French convoys of money and arms and food and killing all the French. Uh, Willikin used to cut the heads off. Um, off his French prisoners, which is rather unpleasant, but I guess it was medieval times. Um, and he successfully, he successfully attacked the besieged castle of Dover. He also trapped Prince Louis, who had practically conquered England at Lewis, and only by the skin of his teeth did Louis um, escape. Um, and he's a real guy. He survived the war. He was handsomely rewarded by Henry III for his valour and lived to a ripe old age before dying in 1257. So he had a very successful career as, um, and this is my real life hero, um, a master bowman, a trickster operating from the wild wood, a passionate opponent of tyranny, a leader of a gang of outlaws with brutal, even gangsterish tendencies, a man whose bold exploits may have been the inspiration for many of the Robin Hood legends that we know and love today. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Willikin of the Wheel. <coughs> Um, I think we'll go straight to questions because we yes, were going to do some... I just have one question. Yes. Did Willikin of the Wheel, was he responsible for the loss of King John's treasure? No. No, <laughs> no he wasn't. Answer. Unfortunately, no. There no, was no. crime jokes and whatever. No. Um, you have to read my historical note. I, I could tell you. It's <laughs> funny because I have still got the historical note to read. Um, questions. Yes, sorry. Who, has anyone got any questions about the heroes and heroines we've been talking about today? Yes, lady over there. Um, some of us have already been talking about this subject, and it was mentioned in, uh, in the previous session, about to what extent what we're writing about in historical fiction is informed by current events. To what, if, to what extent are your okay. choices of heroes and heroines informed by your personal interpretation of what okay. is happening today? Okay. Good question. Okay, so to what extent are your heroes informed, the way you write them, informed by current events? Um, Joanne. Yeah, I, I'll take that because I, I, I had a, a quandary when I was writing the first of the Tudors, Jasper, um, because there is a situation where his brother Edmund marries, as probably most of you know, Margaret Beaufort at the age of 12 and <coughs> gets her pregnant at thir just 13. Um, and, and nowadays we would consider that to be child molestation. It, it's not... Uh, it, it was perfectly legal at the time. Uh, the church said that a, a girl was um, ready, ready for it at 12. And, um, but most people did d defer uh, until 14, at least. How did you write that? Did you write it exactly as it was uh, I didn't write it as it was in history because um, I, I didn't want it to be a rape. Uh, you know, because I don't believe it was a rape. Because right. she was very fond of Edmund her entire life. Um, right through to, uh, you know, as the father of her child, she, she was, she was, he was the husband that she revered the most. So I think that that proved that she was not 
to do rage change her age? Or no. 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 Okay. You'll have to read it to find out okay. what I did. Right. <laughs> um, anyone else want to weigh in on that? Or should we go to yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, sticking with the, the topic of women's lives, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm, I've been drawn to exploring early modern women's lives because I think there are contemporary parallels. And I think if you look at women who are living in fundamentalist Islamic cultures, they lead the same kind of life. And I think that there's something we can articulate about that and try and understand the plight of some other women that are living at the say and nowadays whose lives are quite inaccessible to us. That's very good. Mm. Any more questions? Yes. Um, do you have one fact that you wish you knew about your character? <laughs> and one fact that you're glad you don't know, so you can make it up. <laughs> um, I can't think, I'm thinking. I, think, I don't think well on my feet. I can't think. Yes, I don't think well on my feet. Um, <laughs> I have things like that, questions <laughs> like that. Um, sort of, um, um, I'm sure that'd be something. I mean, given that, well, I wish I knew more about Willigan and the Wheel. I wish I knew more than the handful of facts that we do have. Because all we know, really, is that he lived, he was from this place and he did this and he did that. But I'd like to know more about his character. So basically, more facts about Willie Kin would be great because I think he would deserve a novel. I mean, I can't do it because I've just done eight Robin Hood books, so it would be a bit repetitive. But I think he did someone. Someone out there wants to do it. You know, someone should do a novel about Willie Kin because he he's such a great hero. I mean, brutal, um, but also cunning, and uh, you know, I mean, a, a guy leaping out from the from the forest to. to Murder Frenchman, you know, what's not to like? <laughs> <laughs> um, that sort of thing. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Um, it's sort of a related question, but I was struck by when you were talking about your hero, you said, you know, he cried, uh, wiped his eyes, took a stiff drink. Um, that's the sort of detail that I really enjoy when I'm reading historical fiction. But then I wonder, especially when you're talking about early modern period or medieval period, how do you balance what's available on the historical record with? Sort of what you make up, like how do you sort of do research? Okay. Oh. Yeah, I tend to, I do research in depth, and I wrote my first novel when I was sort of 15. I've been researching the Middle Ages ever since, and that's, I'm not telling you, well, many decades later. Um, but what I do is, when I come to a, to a scene, I ask myself, on a scale of 1 to 10, how likely is this person to have reacted this way, thought this way? Mm. Um, how likely is this scene to have happened? If it's an eight or above, I'll go with it. If it's less than that, I will find a way round. And that is part of the wonderful challenge of writing historical fiction, um, is to find ways round that don't distort the history and yet still make a damn good story. And that's it. You know, as writers, we are the bridge between the reader and that historical period. And that makes sense to us with our modern sensibilities, mm, I suppose, yeah. in a way. You're, that would be yes. part of that marking, won't it? I way. think it, well, about, it's, it, it's about getting a person of modern sensibilities to understand yeah. that what, yeah. what went on. It's one of the balances. Um, um, and not being untrue to, yeah. the, to yeah. the past. And maybe to make it resound with today, uh, you know, that, that, that people would recognise and say, well, we were like that too. Exactly. I and mean, we are like that. And they were, th they were the same. Um, but I always, I always start with that premise anyway, yeah. that people haven't changed in 2,000 yeah, years, so that whoever yeah. it is, they're going to basically be the same as they're, they're they work to different love. rules but yes they, yeah they are but the they're going to feel pain, there's a wonderful love, jealousy, um, yeah you know, there's a wonderful 13th century quote i've forgotten actually who do wrote it but it's 13th century where the man the it's a male writer he says i've never cared much for children the um, the baby wakes everyone up at night with its screaming the middle one keeps running out in the road under, under by under a cart if you're not watching it <laughs> And the older one has to be fetched back from the taverns and keeps asking for money. <laughs> so it's like, mm, yeah, this is close as we were then. Yeah. Um, you had a question over there. One more question. Yeah. One more question. Last question. Um, you know, I just wanted to know, do you, do you have sometimes stand back from yourself if you get a bit too overexcited about your character and, and sort of try and get, how do you sort of get perspective? I, I, I think that the, 
I never do this. But this is how my fantasy writing technique would go. I would I would write a novel and stick it in a drawer for a year, yeah. Yeah. and then come back mm. yeah, and look at it again. Time. But of course, I can't do that because I always write things at the last minute, and it's you know I've got an editor banging on the door saying where is your manuscript, and then I give it to them. So ideally, yes, that would be the way to do it. And in fact, I have had bits of writing stuck around in drawers, and I brought them out, and they either turn out you think wow, I love this character, or, or my God, I've really over-egged mm-hmm, this one. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so distance is, I think, crucial as a, for, for writers, though we don't often get it. Personally, I think if I, if I get immersed in a character, then I feel I'm there. You know, I've, yeah, I've succeeded. Mm-hmm. Um, if I know exactly what they're going to do because I'm so familiar with them, then, you know, that makes them good, I think. I, you know, and usually when you read them back, they are. I mean, otherwise you wouldn't... Yeah dish them out. <laughs> I, I'd agree with you, John. I think there's a, a moment, certainly for me, you know, you feel such a strong affinity with your character, whether you like them or not is, yeah. is irrelevant, but it's as if, you know, they are, you, you, ha- you then can trust your instincts about them. If you become that close, you can just write and trust what you're writing, and then you stick it in the drawer and you come back to it. Mm. And then, and then you can see if, if you might have kind of gone a little bit too far with something. But I do think that point where you have to almost be thinking the thoughts of your character is really, really key to the part of, to, to creating a character. I think there's a difference, though, between... Uh, or, well, they're not... A difference between getting uh, uh, somebody alive in your head and some, getting somebody alive on the page. Um, yeah. You know, they're both needed, and the, but they're both happening perhaps at slightly different mm-hmm. times. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. OK, that's all we've got time for, except for one thing. We're going to have a vote. You guys are going to vote on who you think is the best um, hero or heroine that we had presented <laughs> to you today. So... Um, I would like to just put your hand up in the air if you think that Jasper, uh, Joanna's Jasper Tudor would be your hero. Okay. Um, How about Elizabeth Chadwick's uh, William Marshall? No. Uh, no. 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 Oh, yeah. oh God, thank you. Oh. Thank you. Um, Arbella Stewart. Okay, well, I... I... <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and is there anybody who wants to vote for Willikin and the Willikin? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I think the winner is William Marshall. Yeah. And thank you very much. <laughs>